Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the previous section of chapter 4, we studied methodology for social change. In this section, we will give some examples to illustrate this methodology. In particular, we look at the transition from hunter-gatherers to feudal societies to city-states to nations. But before we start, it's useful to clarify a pedagogical principle. Every concrete example can be understood only as an instance of some universal principle. So when we talk about a tree, this is a category which exists in our minds. It's a universal. And a particular tree is an illustration, an instance of that. Similarly, a tree is part of a forest. Forest is a category, a collection in our mind. Now, this is a bit uh, difficult uh, philosophically, but basically we can understand universals, abstract concepts only in terms of their manifestations as the particular. But also we can understand a particular item only as a representation of a universal principle. A specific tree in all its detail as a unit, uh, as a very particular entity, cannot be understood because there are just too many such entities to be comprehensible. So this idea that looking at the one particular instance and, extra, and uh, extending it to a universal and similarly trying to understand a universal in terms of its exemplification via concrete aspects is different from the standard methodologies discussed in West, uh, which are induction, deduction, and transduction for the acquisition of knowledge. Anthropological studies show that early human societies were hunter-gatherers. They either hunted or they gathered food for to make a living. As a Marxist analysis suggests, this mode of gathering food and uh, this economic organization imposes some patterns on thoughts and actions of societies. So for example, it suggests that uh, these societies would be nomadic because local supplies of food and game would be exhausted. So they would move from place to place. It would have a natural philosophy that of mother earth that the earth uh, provides for us and we will take care of the environment as opposed to urban life today, which detaches us from our environment by hiding the sources which provide our food to us. In politics, uh, a nomadic society tends to be egalitarian because anybody can move out of their own place. They are equipped to move and travel. And so subgroups which are discontented can move away. Uh, and there would tend to be no slavery because you're so living so close to subsistence that you cannot afford to have a person and provide the food for him so that he would provide service for you. Similarly, there would be no concept of private property in such a society because you just keep moving and you take advantage of whatever the land has to offer. So this analysis shows how the economic system can condition the thoughts and philosophies uh, of people. Now, uh, in the process of social change, suppose that these people learn how to cultivate crops. Then uh, they must abandon the nomadic lifestyle because you have to settle in one place to plant and then to harvest. And also you have to have a notion of private property because once you plant, you don't want other people to come in and harvest. So um, one would think that a natural division would emerge that the gatherers, the people who used to collect food would become farmers, but the hunters would become soldiers. And they would find that robbing farmers who have ample supply of food is more, uh, is easier than hunting. And so the farmers would tend to need protection from these roaming bands of soldiers. And this would basically be the impetus for a feudal society where a feudal lord who has a collection of soldiers uh, protects the peasants in return for collecting some uh, tributes in forms of food. And there would be a neighborhood castle and the farms would be planted in the environments of that. And so roaming bands of soldiers would be discouraged by the armies with the feudal lord. 
at a higher level, a collection of feudal lords living nearby would uh, tend to uh, prefer a peaceful relationship which would give them greater power and uh, that would lead to the creation of city-states uh, which and once you have a city-state you need to have a governance structure and uh, with this uh, economic power you can maintain an army and basically the history of Europe was the emergence of lots of city-states and their continuous battles with each other for power. Now, if uh, multiple city-states align, they can command greater power, and that is basically what led to the emergence of the nation. So one of the key insights of um, Ibn Khaldun was the need for a collective identity, which allows for collective action. So in creation of nation, this is an essential component, the need for the people to imagine themselves as a part of a community, and it, this must be strong enough that you're ready to live and die for it because you will need armies to protect the nation. And so the imperative to create a national identity, and this was done by the means of uh, newspapers, according to Benedict Anderson and many other uh, media. So how well does this nation concept fit into Islam? Today, we take it as natural because we are born in nations, but actually, uh, Iqbal uh, said that this is a new, newly minted God and uh, the clothing it wears is the coffin of religion. As opposed to this, Lama Hussain Ahmed Madani was interested in using the power of the state to oust the British. And they had a big debate about this. And ultimately, uh, it was clear that both were in agreement that the nation is in fact contrary to Islamic ideals. but uh, Allama Madini was in, interested in using the nation as a pragmatic strategy to use the power of the nation in order to oust the British and achieve liberty. This topic of the nation state continues to be of central importance and very divisive in Muslim debate. Uh, while Halak has suggested that the nation state is intrinsically incompatible with Islam, and therefore attempts to use the state to implement Islam are bound to fail because of the contradictions between the ideological frameworks which create a nation and the ideological frameworks of Islam. So this concludes our discussion of section 4.3 and basically the idea was to show how naturally social change occurs through the pressure of um, various uh, environmental factors as well as various ways of organizing society these emerge naturally under historical sources and these can be studied systematically of course what we have given is a sketch of social change actual change is much more complicated and doesn't proceed smoothly like this and studying particular instance of how it actually ha happened in any specific time and place gives a lot more insights which cannot be conveyed in this uh, in this overall broad picture schematics